Just very, just briefly, over the last 15 months or so, um, people like ourselves have been meeting together to just explore how to basically enrich our community by producing locally what we consume locally. And we're starting on that road. And we've been exploring this in committees or groups. And these groups range from understanding our local water and how to preserve it and how to use it effectively and keep it uh, pure and so on, food. And uh, in the future, we'll be looking to create uh, organic farms um, for, our, for, our, for our food supply. And uh, those are already begun, actually. But we're looking to do that in a, in a bigger sense. We'll be looking also at transportation, energy. We've also been looking at social organization, how we organize ourselves together to be effective as a community. And also looking at uh, other areas like shelter. So these are some of the groups that have been sitting together and coming up with projects. And an example that, that Ron mentioned just now, to solarize all the city buildings. And over this 15 months, we've really been encouraging as many people as possible to come together like this, special events, special evenings, and also to sit together to plan for the future. And uh, just to remind us that we do stand on the shoulders of many initiatives and visions and groups that have come before us of what economic localization is, which is really being a community. You know, those core values of being responsible for our, our, the place where we live and taking care of it. Uh, using our ingenuity to come up with creative ideas to keep ourselves gainfully employed and so on. And, and to share in our abundance. And also security. We have to look after our long-term security. And in that respect, we've been having a number of forums. One recently was to do with emergency preparedness. And some of you, I'm sure, attended that. Where we had a number of representatives from our county and locality to talk about literally how to take care of ourselves in the case of emergencies. Be they, you know, disastrous floods or tsunamis, which is unlikely to happen here. <laughs> But uh, any kind of urgency. In other words, coming together as a community. So these are our four core values. We call them RISC, R-I-S-C, responsibility, ingenuity, security, community. And in that respect, just remember what well is. Well is, a, well is not a separate, in a sense, distinct organization, although it might appear that way. We're really, we refer to ourselves sometimes as an advocacy. We just come together to promote as much local initiative and self-reliance as we can. So in that respect, we're catalysts for all the other groups in the community, and many of us, of course, are part of those groups. So uh, it's good to remember you know, that we are in the warp and weft of our community together. These last 15 months have been an incredible um, time for me, certainly, and I'm sure for most of us here. And like all organizations, uh, it's important sometimes just to step back and take a look at where we've come from and where we might be headed. But uh, with that respect, um, taking a step back and just, in a sense, taking stock, uh, what we're thinking to do is uh, to hold uh, really a three-part workshop on just stepping back, looking at where we've come from, what we've done well, what we haven't done well, um, how we may need to restructure ourselves, uh, and so on and just look to the future. And, and that means embracing all the different facets of, this, of our community here, um, so that we can really start to think together and work together to create the future that we want. And uh, a big part of that, I think, is, uh, is making ourselves as economically successful as possible so our young people can stay here. I'm sure, as you know, we lose a great many of our young people. You know, they grew up in our town, they love this area, they go off to find the fame and fortune. And, Many, of course, are always going to do that, but it's a pity to lose more than what it is that 93, 94% of our young people. So to build our economy and to, uh, to have a future that is, 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 really, uh, is a really wonderful one. So we'll be looking at vision and values, and, uh, and then the part three is really uh, pulling it all together to create the strategic plan to implement our vision. And this is going to be something we're going to craft together. Okay, so we'll draw on all our best practice, all our best thinking, and, uh, and we're going to make a blueprint for the future for ourselves, for our community. And uh, in that respect, uh, the speaker series have been an extremely important part of uh, what we've been doing over these 15 months. And Jason briefly is going to, uh, shortly, is going to introduce our speaker tonight. Um, and uh, I think this is our 14th 
event, something like that we've had in the last 15 months, something like that. 14th speaker event, yeah, which is pretty amazing. And, um, and our speakers have helped us to bridge between the vision we've been creating and the practical projects that um, have been a, a, an important part of really what we've been trying to create here. So these two places of doing our inventory, seeing what we have, the future, the vision we want to create, and bridging those two places through the practical projects. And tonight I think we're going to uh, hear a lot about the practical business of uh, nourishing ourselves. So, in that, so if I can introduce Jason, maybe you can introduce our speaker, or introduce the person who's going to introduce us. Yes, I would like to. I want to bring up Gloria Decatur. Introduce. Gloria, come on up here. If you might remember, if you were here um, 11 months ago, I believe, Gloria and Stephen Decatur were our speakers. Yeah. Gloria provided some of the food for tonight that Jess is going to cook from uh, Life Power Farm in Covalo. And Jessica happens to be a member of that farm. No, actually. No? No. no. You go up there, though. I've been to visit. You've been to visit, okay. <laughs> but, so, I'm a friend of my farm. You might come in. You may talk to <laughs> anyway. A friend of the farm. I'm a friend of the farm. So um, I would like to ask Gloria then to give uh, her introduction to our speaker tonight, Jessica Prentice. I met Jessica. Um, about a year and a half ago in Mill Valley at a um, Nourishing Traditions workshop with Tom Cowan and she was preparing the food and um, I actually didn't get to go and speak with her but um, she had this whole array of food on the table. She made all these fermented drinks and and was presenting all these things to people. And one of the things she presented was a, a package of chicken feet. And talked about where you could get those chicken feet and, and um, at what stores, Trader Joe's, and you know, they probably were from Marine Sun Farms. And, um, and she didn't focus so much on organic, which is always my focus, either it's organic or biodynamic, and so I had to think about that a minute, what she was doing there. And then she brought up some cheeses, several different cheeses and butters, and they weren't all organic or biodynamic. And I thought, well, what's the deal here? <laughs> I'm not quite sure where she's going. And um, it was a wonderful event, and we really enjoyed it, although I felt a little bit of, out of place um, I was probably the only farmer there, and there's a bunch of Mill Valley moms, and um, you know, for them, I thought I could just go out and butcher a chicken and get the chicken feet. <laughs> <laughs> so it was a little bit different perspective. And, um, and then I heard about Jessica for the next, um, oh, I guess almost a year. And friends of mine had heard her speak and taken um, cooking workshops with her. And, and I said, well, one of these days, again, I'm going to see Jessica and see, you know, what our relationship is going to develop into. And so last summer, um, Jessica did the uh, food preparation for the Fourfold Healing Conference in Oakland that was put on by Tom Cowan, Sally Fallon, and um, Jamin McMillan. And before each meal that was presented, that Jessica prepared with the help of quite a few people, she came to each group um, of people who were at this conference and she um, provided us with the menu. And in providing us with the menu, it was not just the menu of the food, but where that food was coming from. Who prepared that food? And also the culture behind that food. What, was the, um, what country was that recipe from? And how did they use that food? And, um, and I just sat there thinking, Wow, you know, because she'd also visited most of the farms and met the people who provided the food, all of the ingredients that she brought, so that when we actually went to um, eat that food at the table, it wasn't just the fact that it was incredibly delicious, but we could think about the apricots being from Jeff and Annie, Maine. To me, that was just like, oh, this is all about community sport and agriculture. This is just what we're doing. And, um, and we could think about the, um, excuse me, the, the, the chicken farmer down in the Century Valley where she got the chickens from and, and how she talked about what their farm was like, what it looked like, 
what they did, what the people were like, who were these farmers, and, um, and all of those things. And I just had to go up to her in the middle of the conference and just thank her so much for um, giving us that perspective before we ate our food and giving us that perspective so that we could be that much more grateful for the food that we were perceiving and that she had prepared with incredible love. Um, Labor Day weekend, um, Jessica, Jessica came to our farm along with a small group of people who are into nourishing traditions and, to come and, and work. And um, they spent the weekend with us working and talking and to get a sense. Um, Jessica's group, they have gone to quite a few different farms just to get a feeling for the farm. What are farmers doing? How are they preparing this food? What do they have to go through? What is the experience? You know, what, what are the um, trials? What are the joys? What do you do to get all this food on the table and down to people who can eat it? And I enjoyed um, incredible conversations with her and got a sense of her clarity, her objectivity, her um, just immense love of food. And then the ultimate was the last time that I saw Jessica, and this was in October. And um, at a locavore event in Mill Valley, again, and um, my husband Stephen and I were there because Stephen was a farmer on the panel and Jessica gave the keynote speech. speech. And I read over her talk um, this evening just before we drove here and I just started crying again. Um, because Jessica talks about relationships, about respect, about um, appreciation for the land, the relationship between the food, the place, the people, the plants, the animal, and how all of those affect us in, in terms of who we are and what we're eating. And, and then she takes it one step further. <laughs> that just brings me to tears every time, just thinking about it's all a gift. And it's so important for us to um, appreciate that and respect that and respect the gift that we're giving and to um, respect the farmers and the stewards who are caring for this land. And Jessica finished speaking and I could not wait to get to her and hug her. I was crying and laughing and so excited. Just. The passion she brought forward, the excitement, the appreciation, the respect. I felt so much um, respect as a farmer that she cared for us, that um, her appreciation of food carried not just to the flavor, but to everything else where it comes before. <laughs> Thank you, Gloria. Ah, it gets, you gotta get all choked up. Um, um, okay, well, we're gonna make a pot of soup, I guess, is what we're gonna do. And um, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna kinda get started on the pot of soup, and then while it's simmering, I'm gonna talk, and then we'll go back and finish the soup, and then we'll pass out tastes and take some questions at that point. So that's kinda the, the shape of, of, the, uh, of what's gonna happen. So um, I think you've got a recipe, or if you didn't, you can pick one up um, out there. And I don't, I'm not um, a big fan of recipes. This recipe is from um, the book that I've written that's coming out in March. It's coming out in a couple of months. And the first two proposals I submitted for a book didn't have any recipes in it. And I kind of got dragged kicking and screaming into this recipe writing thing because to me, the real pleasure of cooking is about the relationship to the food. And we get, um, we get really attached to a recipe and to following a recipe. And it can have sometimes the effect of being sort of disempowering. And to take us away from our senses and into our sort of analytical mind instead of, instead of looking, smelling, tasting, 
you know, listening, using all of our senses when we cook. We instead just, you know, okay, what, da, 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 oh, I don't have enough of that. And we get all, you know, sort of frantic and neurotic. And, and you know, Americans have a lot of that energy anyway. We don't really need any more, <laughs> especially after working all day to come home and have to cook that way. Oh, you know, what was I, you know. Um, but the fact of the matter is I couldn't sell the book without recipes, so I had to put them in there. Um, and I do find that the way that I've made my peace with recipes, and I mean, don't get me wrong, I've got a huge, you know, bookshelf full of, of recipe books, and I love reading recipes and looking to recipes for inspiration. But my, my, the piece that I've made with recipes is that I see them as maps. And we all sort of know how to use maps in our life. We know that if we're going to a new place, it might be a good idea to have a map. And we may, and to find a place, have to follow a map. You know, a Yahoo map or a printed map or whatever kind of map. We might have to follow a map. But once we know a place, we don't necessarily need that map anymore. And we can, and we can set it aside. Or we might just have to glance at the map. Where was that again? Oh yeah, that's where that was. And we instinctively sort of you know, regulate our attachment to them. We know that they are only just a piece of paper. We know that they're sometimes wrong, that they sometimes lead us astray, that things change, that roads close, that, you know. So um, we kind of know that we have to have more than just a map. We have to have our senses too. We have to kind of be present and that the, the map is only a, a sort of a piece and a tool. And that's sort of how I look at recipes. It's, it's great when you're trying to cook something you've never cooked before to follow a recipe, maybe the first time, and then you kind of, you know, you kind of know the territory a little bit, and the next time you might just glance at it and say, what did, the, what did that recipe, you know, what was, what did she put in there? Oh yeah, it was these kinds of things, and, but you don't necessarily stay attached to the quantities. It's very important to remember that we didn't have any measuring cups or measuring spoons until a hundred years ago. It's a very, very, very recent development. None of our great, great, great grandparents cooked with measuring cups and measuring spoons. It was uh, completely unnecessary. So recipes are a gift in the sense that they can, they really can take us somewhere, just like a map, that we never thought we could go. You know, I can read a recipe for a West African stew and create something that I might get in West Africa, which I couldn't do without a recipe. But it's also important to know when to put them aside and to, to learn to rely on your own senses and to constantly kind of wean yourself off of them, I think. That's just my opinion. And there's people, I'm a pretty intuitive kind of cook. I'm a pretty, um, I don't know if it's the left brain or right brain or whatever, but I know there's people who, who cook like it's a laboratory experiment and they have to have everything and they have to measure everything and probably some of you live with those people and that's fine that those people are out there, but I just am inviting you to, to, to look, you know, to, to look at the recipe but put it aside and hopefully in sort of doing my demo I will give you a sense of my approach to cooking. Now the reason I've given you this recipe is one that it really works with the sort of old-fashioned root cellar vegetables that are the things that we have in winter. And I think it's always, there's a lot of people in this country that sort of um, are seasonal in their approach to eating seasonally. They eat seasonally in summer but they don't eat seasonally in winter. And I think we all fall into that to some extent, and of course, people who live in the very far north have a whole set of challenges that we don't have here. But um, I really love, love, love winter produce, and I actually, I actually enjoy winter cooking more than summer cooking, partly because summer cooking is so easy. You don't really have to do anything. You slice some tomatoes and put some basil on it and, you know, call it a day. Or you just, you know, you boil the corn for 30 seconds and you eat it. But winter cooking is a little bit more, um, you know, you have to, you have to, these, these vegetables take a little longer to cook, so you have to kind of have a little bit more human energy into it. So I actually like it a little bit better. But this, this basic format that I've given you in this recipe works year-round for all different kinds of vegetables. And um, I think it's great to be able to make a basic pureed vegetable soup because you can do that with a million different vegetables that are in season coming from your CSK or your farmer's market. And it's one of those basic skills that I think everybody should know how to do. I understand that it's pretty much daily supper fare in France. That's pretty much what you have is a, you know, a creamed vegetable soup and some bread and cheese, maybe a salad, and that's your dinner. And a lot of times at my house, that's dinner too. And if you just have one thing in the, you know, in the fridge, a, broccoli, you know, a head of broccoli or a little bag of zucchini or whatever, you can make a pureed vegetable soup and, and it's dinner. So it's kind of a template that you can use for lots of different things. 
So what we're going to do here is um, I collect golden vegetable bisque or some nonsense like that. But it, um, you know, you have to make these things sound good. Uh, you know, you can't just say throw everything in the pot and puree it up. Um, but um, all these winter vegetables marry really well together. Different pro pieces of kinds of produce have different amounts of sex appeal. And you know, heirloom tomatoes are like extremely high in the sex appeal category. And so this is why you know, they are major money earners for, for organic farmers, because they can charge a lot for them. Well, the kind of the opposite end of the spectrum is uh, the rutabaga, <laughs> um, which, ha which has no sex appeal. Um, <laughs> Uh, but I think that's too bad. And it took me a long time to learn to, to really love rutabagas, but I do now. And um, you know how they've, uh, they started calling uh, prunes dried plums now to try to, uh, it's a PR campaign, you know. So I've been trying to think with rutabaga what we could do. And in England, they're actually called Swedes, which, and, and we all know how sexy the Swedish people are. So it could be like the sexy Swede or something like that. Um, but anyway, so we've got some rutabagas, I think. Uh, are they rutabagas? Yeah. I think, Spring, you said turnips, but I think they're rutabagas because they're, they're long. Yeah, okay. And then we've got um, some, yeah, it's a sexy Swede. And um, actually, parsnips kind of uh, suffer a little bit. They have a little more sex appeal than, than, uh, than, uh, than rutabagas, but not a whole lot. And these ones are particularly, you know, you have to look beyond the surface to, 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 to feel the love. But um, I think they're going to be great. These carrots um, are just irresistible. I mean, there's just, they're beautiful. And I think these parsnips are beautiful, too. Everything's beautiful. Um, and the onions, the onions are just unbelievably beautiful. Um, it's pretty, it's pretty uh, rare to see such a... Uh, a, a picture-perfect onion. So we're going to take these things and, uh, and turn them into soup. Um, the only thing that I wish I had that I don't have that's on your recipe list is either some parsley or some celery root or some um, celery itself, because all these things are fairly sweet. And in the, in, the, in the classic European tradition in soup making, you have a mirepoix, which is a combination of three things. You have an allium, which is either onions or leeks, usually. You have um, a, a sweet vegetable, such as carrots or parsnips. And then you have a savory vegetable, celery, celery root, or at least you have a little bunch of parsley. So if anybody happens to have any of those things, like out in their car or next door or whatever, um, it'll make the soup more delicious. But I'm, I think we can manage without it if, if we have to. Um, so I'm going to, huh? Just a couple stalks would be awesome. Thank you so much. <laughs> Woo! OK. It's always a good idea to ask, just in case. So I'm just going to show you how I cut an onion, because I do feel like sometimes one of the things that stops us from cooking at home is that we, you know, for whatever reason, you know, our mothers didn't cook, or we rebelled against our mothers cooking, or whatever. We don't quite feel comfortable with doing a lot of these things. And sometimes it's, it's something as simple as, you know, I don't want to cut an onion that keeps us from making dinner. Believe, you know, believe it or not, it might be subconscious, but you know, you just <laughs> don't want to deal. You know, um, and I might cry, and it's, I, you know, I have sympathy for the onion, but that's not where that's coming from. Um, so, I think the easiest way to cut an onion is to put the the root side that way, the stem side that way, cut the tip off, cut it in half from, you know, through the core, not the other way, and then peel it, because then you've got your little, your little edges started, so it's easier to peel that way, I think. And we're going to make a little compost pile here. I think one of the mistakes that people make is they cut off both ends, and the root end actually holds your onion together, which makes your life a lot easier when you're cutting. So leave the root end on. If the, if the onion's really fat, which this one's pretty nice and fat, and you want smaller pieces, you can cut it towards the root end through the, you know, sort of through the middle like that, and then cut in strips going up to, oh great, perfect, thank you up to the root, but it's still all being held together. You're not dealing with lots of like, you know, pieces falling apart, which can get to be annoying. 
And then your last cutting, we don't have one of those mirrors or one of those things they have on the Food Network, but um, then, then you've, it's, it's held itself together and you have had to do a lot less work. And then you just have this little end that's left and you can just chop that up. So I think we're gonna have a couple of um, assistants come up and, and so I don't have to cut all these onions because now that you've seen me done, do one, then it's gonna be very boring after that. But try that next time. And um, I've got a little burner here. We're gonna get that going. And you know, in the, the, the soup making approach that I'm gonna teach is pretty much the European one because that's more what I know. And yeah, if you wanna cut those onions, that would be great. Um, I'm gonna use some Strauss butter. It's, you know, as local as we could do. And so the first step with soup making generally, in the European tradition anyway, is to saute your mirepoix in your fat, whatever it is, olive oil, butter, lard, whatever, whatever you like, whatever you have. Um, so we're melting the butter in there and then we're gonna throw our onions in. And then we've got all of these other fun things. Um, the, whether or not to, pe to peel or not to peel. Oh, thank you so much. <laughs> Woohoo! I promise I won't use it all even though it's tempting, but I won't. Um, I'm actually going to do this, these next. That's great. I'll use, how many did I say I was going to use? Three or four? I'll use three. Did I say I would only use two? Okay, I used three. There's still enough to take home. Get this going. I want to just encourage you guys not to skimp on fat. I, th I think fat is very, very important for all of your um, hormonal and other processes. I eat a very, um, you know, you could say high fat, which is probably what, you know, doctors would call it, but I call it a rich in fat diet. It's, um, it's the most important energy food that we have. I always think about uh, maintaining our energy as being sort of like building a fire. You know how you build a fire in the fireplace? And the big logs, the logs that burn slow and for a long time and really keep the fire going are the fats in your diet. And then the medium-sized logs are the proteins. And then the really small logs are the, are the carbohydrates, the, the complex carbohydrates. And then your, your kindling is your refined carbohydrates. And then you know, if you use newspaper or whatever to get it going, that's your sugars. And then if you drink caffeine, that's like lighter fluid. <laughs> okay, so those are going. <laughs> yeah, I can go, go for it. So, thank you. Oh, it's so exciting. I never have helpers like this. I, was, I thought I was gonna come early and make this soup ahead of time, but that didn't end up being the case. So I said, well, we can do it if I just have people help. So, um, especially with something like a pureed vegetable soup, um, you know, the, the, the richer it is in fat, the more it's sustaining it's gonna be. You just you really wanna, in my opinion, make sure you have those big logs that are fueling you. So butter is, you know, just a fabulous fat. So then we've got our three. And I, you know, celery is pretty straightforward. The only thing is, a lot of people think for some reason you have to cut it one stalk at a time, like that was, that's some rule that they were told, like you could only cut one stalk of celery at a time. I could cut, I, you know, I cut this whole bunch like this, except that I'm not cutting the whole bunch, but if I were, that's how I would do it. I didn't quite do this, well I actually did do this. When you're, when you're melting your butter, throw one little piece of onion in there, and when you hear it start to sizzle, that's when you throw the rest in. So this is, you know, the sense, you know, you listen. You're kind of doing other things, you just throw one in, and oh, it's sizzling, then you know it's time to put your other, your other onions in. So now we've got onions and some celery going. Um, so to peel or not to peel, you just look at the vegetable. I mean, this skin is so, so super tender. There's just absolutely no reason to peel that. This is not quite as, as tender. It would probably be okay not to peel. Not, to, yeah. Um, but my preference is to peel it. Because I want, I want the soup to be, you know, pretty uh, silky. So, but it, it really depends on the vegetable. Just look at it and see. So, um, 
you know, this, the same kind of thing with, even with a rutabaga, you can cut off, you know, it's got all this rooty end. Then you can leave this on, cut it in half. And then the same thing, let it hold itself together. We work hard enough in this country. Let the, you know, let the, vet so the vegetable's holding itself together. And so I'm not, you know, I don't have lots of things flying. And it doesn't really matter how big the chunks are because you're going to puree the whole thing anyway. So just, um, you can either do more work by cutting it smaller in the beginning and it will cook faster or do less work and let it cook a little longer. So just all depends on your, are those the last two onions? Mm -hmm. Okay, good. We've got, we've got lots of onions in there. Okay, so, yeah, we're not going to be able to fit, well, obviously not all the carrots, but I think not even all of everything. Do you want this one? Yeah, you can throw those in. They, they, they shrink down. Um, you don't even have to cut this up, you know. I'm, I'm kind of a, um, I'm, I'm a, a bit of a lazy cook. I really just want to do it as fast and easily as I can with as minimal amount of fuss, and that's what enables me to really cook home-cooked food every night, is that, you know, for the most part, oh, yeah, here's a peeler, and there's another peeler over there. Yeah, let's peel those rutabagas, and there's another one right there. Um, least amount of work. I, wanted, I want dinner to be on the table in a half an hour. That's kind of, you know, and especially when I was working full time, you know, this idea of working f a full day, you know, with my commute, because I live in the Bay Area, you know, with my commute, and the extra hour your boss expects you to work, and the hour for lunch, I was gone like 11, 12 hours a day. And this is what, how a lot of people live. It's really kind of frightening. So I'd get home, and you know, I mean, I was starving. I was starving, I was so hungry. I really, and this is why convenience foods have made such a huge um, inroad into our, uh, you know, our food dollars, is because we're hungry, we want it fast, so. Um, should I be using this more? Okay. Um, so with my cooking, it's the same thing. It's got, it has to have that element of convenience. It can't be too fussy or too, too, too time consuming. So, okay, these guys, well, I picked the easy one. Some of these have, um, you know, a whole, whole lot of, like a clod of mud sticking in there. I mean, that's a good thing to notice. They've been washed, but you know, it's just really buried down deep. So maybe I'll do that one. Um, so I actually, uh, this is another place where I think a lot of people, people have this idea, I don't want to waste any. I don't want to waste any, so I'm going to cut around every little crevice and get every little morsel. Okay, when you've worked in a professional kitchen, you just, you get rid of it. Okay, you start with a fresh thing. And, and you, um, you know, we have a lot of produce that's, you know, going into compost piles, so just buy a little bit more and just save yourself a little trouble and don't, you know, just don't obsess about all these things, you know, just cut it out. I mean, if you're really starving and you really have nothing, you know, you're like Scarlett O'Hara and you kept this one root, then you might want to cut around every little bit. But, you know, most of us aren't in that situation. So just save yourself some trouble. Just, you know, it's, it's okay. It's going to go back to the earth. It's going to go into the compost pile. Consider it a gift to the earth. You know, you say, this part's for me, that part's for the earth, and just make your peace with it. Yeah, that's My for garden. Your, your garden, exactly. So, um, but other than that, you know, it's a little, I would actually give this a little peel. I would cut off the really, really cloddy, dirty parts, and then, yeah, and then just, and then just, you know, give a peel to, you don't have to peel it really carefully, but it's got a lot of, um, you know, it's got a lot of, grown in dirt, like, like a grown in toenail kind of thing. So, and then so, you know, ooh, that's exciting. So we've got a, um, that's, um, it's, it's the core. So it doesn't go that deep. So, but that's, it's a good idea to cut that out. So anyway, then, then just cut it into big chunks. And again, the nice thing about a pureed vegetable soup is that it doesn't have to be pretty. It just, you know, big pieces like that are fine. That's enough rutabagas. Stop on the rutabagas. Let's do some parsnips. And then these carrots are, yeah, that's enough. We, I mean, we've only got one pot here. Um, <laughs> we've got enough. We, we could make, we could feed the whole town with this. Um, 
So these carrots, you don't need to do anything. You know, just chop them into big pieces and throw them in. Any questions on any of that? No. Um, so there's just that, um, that small stick of butter, the onions, and you know, it's, it's a good idea um, for pureed vegetable soups, my goal generally is to, as much as possible, bring out the flavor of the vegetables that you're working with and to distract from it as little as possible. And so one of the ways that I do that is um, I, don't, uh, I don't let the onions brown. Because as we all know, with caramelized onions, browning the onions gives a very distinct caramelized oniony flavor, which is great if you're making uh, French onion soup. You know, that's what you want. You want to caramelize your onions. Or great when you're making caramelized onions to put on pizza or whatever. But when you're really, when you, when you want to taste the vegetable, if you caramelize your onions, if you let your onions brown, then it, it, that flavor overshadows. So, um, so it's just something to watch. If, if, you know, if your onions start to brown a little, it's not the end of the world. But that's kind of my goal is to, is to have the onions wilt, sweat, kind of wilt, and soften, but not, uh, not brown. So that's kind of what's happening in there. That's what's happening in there. So that's good. Um, though, I mean, a lot of times when I'm cooking and teaching at the same time, you know, the onions are doing what the onions are doing, and I'm not in, in charge. Um, okay. The other thing that I think really brings out the flavor of a pureed vegetable soup is a bouquet garni, which is another classic French uh, cooking thing that I think is very underused in the United States. Um, but it's, it's not underused by me. <laughs> it's maybe overused by me. But basically, bouquet garni is just a little bundle of herbs. And it, it, al it always has bay leaf in it, though you can also just throw it, you know, a, a single bay leaf in. It has, yeah, and we can do some carrots down there too. Yeah, let's do a couple handfuls. This is great, you guys, thanks. And uh, let's do all those parsnips, because, yeah, I know, I know, but go for it, they're good. Um, so bay, and then I like to put thyme in. Now, so this is, these are sprigs of thyme that um, are dry. And this is how I dry my thyme. I have a drawer of all my herbs. I have a drawer, and when I, when I either harvest them from my garden or get them at the farmer's market or have them from, from wherever, I just take the bunch, I take the little twisty off, usually, not always, and I throw them in the drawer, and I close the drawer. You don't have to do anything, they dry. Okay, so people are like, oh, you know, I don't know how to dry herbs. That's how, that's how I do it. Um, I've never had any problems. So anyway, these were just dried in a drawer, just sitting there with absolutely no further attention to the matter whatsoever. Same with this sage. And you can absolutely use fresh here. Fresh, it's just that um, because I have this drawer full, I always have dried, and that's often generally what I use. So thyme, sage. The other thing that's really nice to put in it is a parsley stem. But as I said, we don't have any parsley, and that's fine because we have celery in there in the same family. They have a similar impact. But you can make up for the loss of one with, with some of the other. Or um, the thing I grow in my garden for that family is lovage, which grows beautifully out here. And it just is, as it's sort of like celery crossed with cardamom is how I think of it. Yeah, Gloria. Yeah, you know, classically, you, take, you don't use the leaves. And um, I've heard that this is, I mean, I, intuitively, it's because you're using the leaves in another way, which is that you're mincing up the leaves and adding them at the end of the soup. But um, I've also heard that the leaves can turn the soup bitter, that the leaves can have a bitter flavor to it. Though I've had, so I tend to be not so strict about it, but I kind of will like cut off the main amounts of leaves, but there'll be some leaves sitting on the stems. And I've never had a problem with it going bitter. But um, I do think you focus on the stems. I mean, to me, one of the ways, one of the reasons that a bouquet garni is great is that it's one of the ways you can use the stems. Like, it doesn't actually have to be any of the leaves. Like, if you've used the leaves of the sage or the thyme for something else, just save your stems and use them in the bouquet garni. It doesn't have to have any leaves. And that way you're using, you're using your stems and then you're using your leaves in another way. And that's particularly true um, if you use, put rosemary in your bouquet garni, which is nice if you want, I mean, it has a very distinct flavor, rosemary does, so if you want the rosemary flavor, then 
You can use a rosemary stem, but definitely take off the needle because otherwise the needles will fall off the stem and into the soup, and then you have little needles, and they don't puree, and they get caught in your teeth. So, um, so the bouquet garni just goes in. What's nice about it is that it's, it's just, to me, it's much easier than sitting there and taking all the leaves off. You know, I just throw it in. A lot of the leaves will fall off in there, but that's okay because it's not rosemary, and it just infuses the whole kit and caboodle with flavor. Okay, so do we have, we have carrot, more carrots coming? Yeah, okay. But I'm gonna go ahead and put water in there. So now we're putting water in. You know, ideally, I usually do this in a flatter pot. You know, this is a very, you know, it's a stock pot more than a soup pot, but this is the only thing I had that was kind of big enough so that we'd all get at least a taste of this soup. Um, I think it's nice to sweat everything, to get everything kind of cooking a little bit, and then put your water in, but it doesn't really matter. I mean, I think it's a little bit better, but this will be fine. Ooh, got some browning going on down there. Woo-hoo! That's okay. It's going to be, this is, got a lot of onions in there, a lot of those gorgeous onions. So, now, um, you could also use um, chicken stock at this point and, you know, homemade chicken stock with your chicken feet um, from the chicken that you butchered yourself out back. And, uh, you know, that makes it, um, you know, it's, it adds a huge amount of minerals, a huge amount of nutrition. It just makes it more nutritious. But you get a great flavor with water, too. And I wouldn't use any other stock other than chicken because, again, you want to bring out the flavor of the vegetables and anything else will compete, will be too strong. But chi- uh, chicken broth, and I'm very, very... Um, minimalist in my chicken broth. Basically, I just use whatever bones, feet, heads, whatever I've got, and then cover it with water, throw some vinegar in, and let it simmer up to 24 hours, or do it in a crock pot. I don't add any vegetables. I don't have any, I don't add any herbs whatsoever to my chicken broth because I really feel like it muddies the flavor. And I just, and and it also, that it gives me a really clean, really light broth that can go in any direction. If I want to do something East Asian, I can do something East Asian. If I want to do something Indian, I can do something Indian. If I want to do something European, I can do something European. It's just a very nutritious but neutral flavored broth. Did you have a question? Um, uh, uh, Just a few splashes, a tablespoon, a quarter cup. It doesn't really matter. What the vinegar does is it draws the calcium out of the bones and into the broth. Vinegar does that in general. So... um, you know, if you're at risk for osteoporosis or anything, you don't want to eat too much vinegar because vinegar draws calcium, which is it's good if you're doing it in the broth because it's drawing the calcium out of not your bones but the chicken's bones, and you know, chicken's d- dead, right? Um, so you know, you don't have to worry about that anymore. The chicken's dead. So, to my mind, the way that you respect the chicken is you use everything from that chicken that you possibly can, and the vinegar draws the minerals out of the bones, especially the calcium, puts it in the broth, and that's actually. Um, our ancestors' primary uh, source of calcium in the diet. That's, it, was, it was bone broth. And all traditional peoples valued the whole animal. The boneless, skinless chicken breast is a, an, an, an abomination uh, on every level. We want to use every part of, of the animal, and uh, including and especially the bones. And bone broths are the curative foods of cultures all around the world. Question here? Um, more carrots. Nah. I think we're good. I think we're good. No, you know, because we've got this gorgeous milk. I might want more. It's going to be really thick. My cooking teacher would not approve. My cooking teacher said you don't want a pureed soup that's like baby food, but it might be a little bit thicker. She said it should pour. It shouldn't plop. (laughs) So if it plops, just don't tell on me. Okay, yeah. I want to ask you about knives. That's the... I always said that... You have to live with a man to have a sharp knife in your house. Uh, but no, I, like, that isn't, isn't no. like K's anymore. So tell me how you, uh, what do you do about good sharp knives? You know, I actually take my knives to the farmer's market and have them sharpened. You know, I have them sharpened by a man. I hate to admit it. Um, but you certainly can sharpen your own knives. It's just something I've never mastered and I go to the farmer's market and there's the guy there and it's just so easy and then I just pay him and they come back sharp. But I will say that, um, huh? Localization, it's my, it's my, you know, my community economic localization plan. Um, I will say that I've never liked using a French chef's knife 
They're very heavy and they're very long. And I think maybe as a woman, and particularly a, a ra rather small woman with a small hand, my favorite knife is the Japanese knife, which is what this is. It's much, much lighter weight and it's got a blunt tip and it's thinner. And this is just, uh, this was part of my, my knife kit when I went to cooking school and this is the one that I've been using. It still has the little initials that I engraved in it when, you know, when I went to cooking school. Um, I just lo I love this knife and I've actually, some students of mine have looked for this same brand and had a hard time finding it, but, um, but any, this is an Usuba, but any uh, Japanese knife will be, will be this shape and I vastly, vastly prefer it. It's also, it's really nice for mincing because you've got a nice hard thing, so you know, you go, it's much easier to mince with than, I don't even know if I have a, I don't think I have a French knife with me because I, I just hate to use them, so anyway. I don't know. No, I no. I don't even know what it is. No. It's, it's a sort of curve. Oh right. Yeah. Is it is it the kind? Then also, there's a cutting board that's a little bit yeah. curved in it. Yeah, I've seen those. Yeah, you know, I've, I haven't been motivated to look for anything else because I'm so happy with this one. But I mean, it's really important to find a knife that you love to use and to find pots that you love to use because it's so much more motivating to cook. And really, what you really want with a pot is heavy bottom. You won't, it's just absolutely the way to go. You won't burn things. It's totally worth the investment. These are um, stainless steel with a layer of aluminum sandwiched in between. So they've got a nice heavy bottom. And all, all my um, our pots are from that same line. And it just makes it so much more pleasurable to cook. It's worth it to invest in a couple of good tools. I don't think you need lots and lots of fancy gizmos and gadgets in your kitchen to cook. but. Um, you know, there's a few things I've been known to take. I take a whisk when I go camping. So, you know, there's a few things I've got to have. And whisk is one of them in a heavy bottom pan. And I take this knife and then I, I can, I'm happy to cook in the desert or wherever. Yeah. Um, I, don't, I don't like nonstick pans. Um, I don't trust them. I'm con you know, there's all these problems with Teflon um, uh, getting into the waste stream. And um, so I just, I really... I, d I don't own any nonstick pans, and when I have to use them, I always hate them. So that's my feeling about, but it's just kind of intuitive. Yeah. Uh, I don't, um, because I'm too lazy. You could. Um, I, I have a fat separator, a glass fat separator, which I got from William Sonoma, which is another treasured tool. And so I, you know, I strain the broth into that and then I pour it out and the fat stays on top and you just get the broth from the bottom. That's the tool that I yet like to use. I don't have the patience to cool the broth and scrape the fat, you know, that's just the thing. Um, but you, you, I mean, it's, it makes a cleaner stock. If you, if you skim as you go, or especially in the first you know, half an hour or so, once it starts to simmer. Also, the simmer on broth should be extremely low. I think the French phrase is that um, a broth should smile. So if you think of boiling, it's kind of laughing hysterically, you know, and, and, and it's simmering, it's kind of giggling. You just want it to be smiling. So you know, just a little plop now and then. I really love the crock pot for making broth. That's, uh, it's very, it's very uh, energy efficient. And then I can get, let it go a long time without worrying about the gas being on or anything like that. And I can even turn it down overnight so that I don't wake up at four in the morning to the smells of chicken broth, which I don't particularly care for. Yeah, back in the back. Oh, go ahead. No, go ahead. We'll go back to you in a sec. Do I what? I have not. I've seen them. And um, I was at the Full Belly, I was working at the Full Belly uh, hose down, and they were used, making cookies in the solar cooker, like 20 feet away from me, and I was um, baking pita breads in the wood-fired oven. And um, at dusk, they came over, they said, can you finish making my cookies? <laughs> <laughs> so I think they have their, I think they certainly have their uses, but. Um, well, I, I do use one, uh -huh. it works great when the days are long. Right. And, it would, and I would assume that it would be really great for broth, too, because it would probably keep it at that. I mean, it's the same kind of cooking that a crock pot does, which is very, very low heat over an extended period of time. Um, though you wouldn't be able to get the 24 hours out, out of it. But you could, um, you know, I think it would be really good for broth. Yeah. And then there was a question here. Do you skim the fat off the, the stock for the texture of the soup? Because I would imagine, I would think, I would think the fat would be healthy. You know, the problem with the fat in, because it cooks for so long, I don't think that the fat 
it on the top of broth is actually either very tasty or very good for you. I have a freezer full of it <laughs> to prove it. I, t I, I save it all and I'm waiting um, to, you know, to turn it into biodiesel. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm, I'm waiting for the, uh, you know, the, the right, the right, I have to like combine it all and then take it down and see if they'll take it uh, and, and turn it into fuel. Um, I, you know, especially, I, I think it can have, uh, it can do some oxidating um, in being cooked that long. So I think it's a little bit oxidized, a little bit rancid. I'm not, I, I, don't, I don't recommend it. I used to save it and cook with it, but I didn't really, I wasn't getting a good vibe from it. So I'm saving it for the biodiesel collective now. <laughs> yeah. And especially the beef, you get a lot. I mean, chicken fat, you just have a little bit. I sometimes do, you know, if I, I always pour, when I put my broth into jars, you know, to freeze it or to keep it, I do make sure that there's a plug of fat on top. And one of the reasons is that that will help preserve it. Um, I've heard people that keep their broth in the fridge for months with that fat layer unbroken. Now, I've never tried doing that, and I don't recommend doing it, but they, you know, if it's anaerobic with the fat on top. If nothing can get into it. So I leave a plug of fat, and I do sometimes take that fat and use that as my saute fat if I'm making a chicken soup or something like that. But, um, but I don't treasure it as a, uh, a, as a super healthy thing. So, yeah. Oh, good. You, uh, you, you want to sharpen mine? mine? No. <laughs> you, you talked about uh, cooking the chicken at a low temperature over a long period of time. Uh huh. And I've always read today that you need to raise the temperature, especially of meats, above a certain temperature and kill whatever bacteria in there. Isn't there a, a problem with cooking it low and slow? No, um, it's above that temperature. It, that temperature is 140, and it's above that. I, um, yeah. I mean, I, and, and also, I do tend to take my crock pot down to warm overnight, and it's cooking it. I think that keeps it at about 140. And then in the morning, I turn it back up to high and kind of and pasteurize it, and then turn it back down and sort of watch it that way. Well, um, I did have some other things I was going to talk about instead of just cooking. Should I move on, or do I'll take one last question, and then, yeah. in jars, what's the secret to that? I have broken so many jars trying to freeze Three inches. Three inches. Yeah. Just got to leave at least two, safer three on top. When you pour, so I, I freeze my stock in mason jars. Um, mason jars, you know, um, I've got a million mason jars of all different sizes and all the lids, they're all wide mouth, so all the lids inner work, so that's really efficient for me. I pour the stock in there and let it cool and leave three inches. It, the only reason that it cracks is because it doesn't have the room to expand. So you just, but, but it's, it's very tempting. You want to just squeeze it into all your jars. No, just let go, get another jar, spread it out, fill it half full if you need to, just train yourself to, yeah, it just needs a good three inches on top. Okay, um, I'm going to talk a little bit, uh, I'm going to let this simmer, which it's doing very nicely. Oh, one last thing. The reason that uh, w it's great to put the lid on. It's not totally necessary, but um, a lid, you know, the, the bouquet garni and even the vegetables have lots of flavor to them. And, and the bouquet garni particularly, we've got thyme, we've got sage, we've got bay. The flavor in there are volatile oils, right? You know how you can make a, an essential oil from all of those things? Volatile oils, this is how you make an essential oil, is they go up in steam. That's how you distill them. So if you have the lid off, that's all your flavor. Bye-bye, bye-bye, bye-bye. If you keep the lid on, flavor's going back in. So if you can keep the lid on, you're gonna keep more flavor. And this is why when you use a crock pot, where you have the lid on and it's cooking really low, you wanna under season it slightly because it concentrates the flavor so much because there's no steam escaping. Yeah. <laughs> That may be true. That may be true. I just know for a fact that the volatile oils do. I once made the very big mistake of trying to reduce uh, rose water. Really bad idea because it just tasted like water. All the rose flavor was gone. <laughs> you know, I was cooking it down to try to like concentrate the flavor. You know, because you can do that with like apple, apple, apple juice. If you cook down apple juice, you get this really nice like apple-y syrup. So, you know, and just completely all the flavor is gone. Um, Okay, um, so I'm going to try to give just a little bit of context um, and talk uh, to this local, to the local food thing. 
And one thing that I've been thinking about, about a lot lately, and I talk about a little bit in my book, and I find a really helpful framework to think about food in this, um, in general, and in this society, is um, based on the work of um, a woman uh, named um, Jeanette Armstrong, who uh, has a center up in Canada. She's an Okanagan woman, and she has a center up in Canada called the Anaukin Center. And that's a word that refers to a traditional Okanagan way of making decisions and how you make a decision in a community that will be the best decision for that community. And this system has been sort of translated or um, kind of turned into English as the four societies process. And in this process, there's four voices that you need to have when you make any decision in the community. And the old terms, the old fashioned terms for those four societies are the mothers, the fathers, the youth, and the elders. And these have kind of been um, the, the interpreted in terms of what that focus is. And these don't, didn't necessarily even have to be related to your gender or your age. These were more conceptual things. Um, and the fathers were the people that, that um, talked about the decision in terms of action. And particularly, any action that ensured the security or the safety or the material needs of that society. So that was kind of the fathers, the action committee, the society, the action society. The mothers were the people who paid attention to relationship, that um, worried about the emotional needs and the, um, the nourishment and the nurturing of that community. The uh, youth were the people who had a vision for change. What needs to be better in, our, in, in this society? What, what, needs to, what needs to change? What, where are we going? What's the next thing? And then the elders were the ones that held uh, the sense of tradition and the sense of place, the sense of connectedness to the land and to what the ancestors knew, and uh, brought the wisdom that was accumulated over the ages. And one thing that Jeanette Armstrong points out is that U.S. society tends to be biased towards the action and the vision side. We're all about doing, and we're all about where are we going? What's the next thing? How can we get better? How can we change? It's all about progress, right? This whole country is founded on this idea of change and progress and the new thing. What's new, and what can we do? You know, we're going to do it, and we're going to do it now. And then we, you know, we go to Mexico and we're like, oh, you know, they're taking a siesta. What's wrong with them? They're not doing enough, you know. Um, and, and we tend to be weak in the areas of relationship and tradition and place. So I found this really helpful when I think about our, our food system. And um, it's really true when you look at our food system, and especially over the past hundred years. I mean, there has been an incredible vision and a huge amount of action. The vision has been to feed a whole lot of people, right? This has been the, the motivating force behind industrial agriculture. And it's all about change. It's all about how can we make it more efficient? How can we, um, you know, we got this growing population. We got we to keep up. We got to get ahead, da, 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 da. And, it's ex and, and we have an extremely complex, uh, sophisticated system for ensuring uh, the, the safety and security of our food system. The USDA, the FDA, these are the things that, you know, we go to Southeast Asia and, you know, we see people frying things on the streets or whatever. Well, you can't do that in, in the United States. It's, it's, it's not allowed by our, uh, our regulate, you know, regulatory systems. And there's, you know, I think it's important as much as Oh, as mad as I get at the FDA and the USDA, because I really do, it's important to recognize the vision that those actions came from and the intention that's out there to ensure the safety of, you know, millions of people. But what's really been lost and really been neglected in our food system is relationship, you know, the mother's the side of it. We don't know where our food comes from in this country. We don't have any relationship to the people who grow it, except those of us who are very, very lucky to have that or have really made an effort to. But by and large, people have no relationship to the people who grow their food. They have no relationship to the ground that it comes from, to even having any clue how it grows or what part of the plant it's from or what it needs or anything. All of that's been severed, though it was very, very much part of our, our, of our ancestors' uh, food systems. 
And of course, tradition. I mean, there is, we really hate tradition. Anything that's traditional in this society, we tend to look at as, as backward and outdated and um, you know, needs to be left behind because we've got this vision for the next thing. And this is, you know, this is the, the bill of goods, really, that farmers were sold on in, in industrial agriculture, is you've got to leave behind those old-fashioned ways, and you've got to do the new thing. You've got to do the next thing. And that's the only way we're going to be safe and secure. And you know, you've got to buy this, and you've got to go into debt, and you've got to take out loans, and you've got to do all these kinds of things. So when I think about food, I really think about these four societies. I think about it's important to honor that need for for security and for safety. And, you know, we have relatively little hunger in this country in terms of physical hunger. I mean, it's been, this system has been very successful in certain ways and with the population growth that we've had. And um, as much as it drives me crazy, I think it's important to sort of acknowledge that. When you get into conversations with people and you're trying to talk about local foods, this is the thing that people will bring up, especially often people from, um, you know, quote unquote, developing countries. Or, you know, I've, I've got family who are Bengali, and you talk to them about food and the food system, and they're just all about industrialization and all about industrial agriculture because they feel like that's the answer to feeding a growing population. And these are real concerns and these are real questions. And, we don't, we don't know at this stage in our development um, you know, whether or not we can, what's sustainable and how we can feed all these people. We, you know, I've, I have this faith that we can feed everybody with local, small scale, uh, organic, community supported farms, but it's really just an article of faith. We don't, we don't know. You know it's, it's, it's my belief, but it, we don't really know. So. Um, and, and, and I think it's also important to, to just think about how these tensions play out in our own lives because it's very easy to get into the blame game, you know, just everything, you know, everything about industrial agriculture is wrong, wrong, wrong. And I mean, that's sort of what I think. But, um, but we all have things, I mean, I, uh, I'm going through this, it's not even a debate. We've pretty much decided because we were given a check for Christmas, my partner and I, we've decided to get a dishwasher. And, all, you know, the people who gave us the check for, you know, were like, you have to get a dishwasher, it'll change your life. Like, you know, dishwasher is going to change your life. And, I mean, I do cooking classes, I do a huge amount of cooking, I do three loads of dishes a day. It's like, it's very appealing, you know, to get that dishwasher. And then I was just talking to somebody over the weekend, they're like, you know, did you know that the divorce rate was correlated with the advent of dishwashers? And da da da. I'm like, oh God. Because people don't, you know, do dishes together in their homes anymore, and, you know, they're, they're isolated, everything. I'm like, well, it sounds like a correlation. Maybe it's not causative, you know. Um, you know, I was thinking the dishwasher was going to prevent the divorce, not cause the divorce. But, um, but th these are real tensions when I think about, um, you know, there's certain things. I've got a microwave in my house because when I bought the house, the microwave was there. Uh, but we're going to get rid of it. I use the microwave at the moment for storing all my sugars, which is a great use because it keeps the ants out. But, um, but it's ugly, and I don't like the energy of it, and we're going to get rid of it. On the other hand... We've also, we recently tiled our kitchen floor, so we pulled out the, the um, and our kitchen's connected to a little laundry room, we pulled out the washer and dryer, and we decided to replace them because they were kind of old and leaking. And it sucked not to have a washer and dryer in the house. I mean, I am really grateful for, for, for clothes washer and dryer. So I just want to warn us against, um, you know, sort of polarizing around these issues. And, uh, you know, one thing is all bad and the other thing's all good. There's, there's all kinds of complex factors that are involved and these tensions play out even in our own lives. And it may be, you know, a dishwasher may work for some family and improve life and then not for another. And that's, you know, there might be some, some room for individual things around that. I mean, I, I do think that the, all the emphasis on convenience and these things are going to save you time has come at a real high cost spiritually. So I acknowledge that. On the other hand, um, I'm not willing to wash all my clothes by hand. So it's, I think it's important to keep those things sort of in mind. Um, what time is it? How much time do I have? 8.05. 8 okay, and we've got to puree this soup. Oh, I've, got, I've got pages. I'm only halfway through the first page. Okay. Well, that's why it's all optional. It's all optional. Um, 8.05. 8.05. And we're supposed to end at 8.30? Is that correct? We're okay? 
Okay, I'm, I'm going to talk for 10 more minutes and then we'll puree the soup and serve it up and I'll take questions. Um, we'll be here until the soup's ready. Okay, <laughs> I'm going to hold the soup hostage. Um, okay, so, I, uh, so, the, so the local food movement, I just have a few things because um, people here are, I was going to talk a little bit about pasteurization of milk, but that's a whole hot topic. I'll leave that aside. Um, instead, no, I don't have time, I don't have time. Um, Instead, um, I'll just talk for a few minutes about some, uh, you know, I'm very involved in the local food movement and a huge advocate. I started the, um, this website with two friends, Locavores, and we challenge people. We pick one month a year and we challenge people to eat as locally po as possible for that month. Last year we did it in the month of August. We had 500 people sign up to eat locally within a 100 mile radius of San Francisco. We had a few people that signed up in other parts of the country, but we were just targeting San Francisco. Um, this year we're going to do May to give people a chance to do it during the spring because August is, of course, the easiest month. Um, and I'm e extremely committed to that. At the same time, again, I, you know, you can probably tell I'm a Libra. You know, I've always got the, um, the one hand. But on the other hand, um, I, because I feel like most of you guys are, you know, you're environmentally conscious and you're sort of already sold on this idea of eating locally and the importance of that, I do want to um, throw in a couple of... Um, just uh, cautions that I feel like are cautions that we all need to kind of think about. Um, I th I'm always very cautious about um, purism, about getting, uh, you know, uh, overly uh, zealous about something. And I think this has been the, really the downfall of a lot of food movements. That's, the, you know, macrobiotics had a lot of really interesting things to say, but what you know, very, there, there was a lot of wisdom there about food and about balance and about yin and yang and all of that. But the reason that it didn't work was because people became sort of fanatical about it. And I think it's important to just always just kind of breathe in and breathe out and not get too overly zealous about anything. And to be committed in a deep way doesn't necessarily mean being, you know, self-righteous or... Um, or a purist about something. It's very important, I think, to acknowledge that we live in the culture and the society and the country that we do. We all have relatives that, well, probably most of us have relatives that eat Velveeta, you know. If we go to their houses, you know, I mean, I won't, I, you know, I won't eat Velveeta, but I also won't lecture about why they shouldn't eat Velveeta. Or, you know, there's just always those times when we need to just be in community with people who might make different choices than, than us. And it, I feel like, you know, being self-righteous or, or lecturing or being heavy-handed about anything ultimately alienates people instead of brings them in. And I want local foods to be a sea change in the way this country eats. I don't want it to be, you know, a little a group of uh, weirdos, you know, that are like fanatical about something crazy. Um, I want it to, this is the way that our ancestors ate. They ate locally and they ate seasonally. This was the way that everybody ate until the rise of industrialization and it's probably the way we'll all eat after the petroleum crash, right? So, so this is, so I mean, it may be a mood issue because we might all be forced to this or we might starve to death or, you know, whatever. Um, <laughs> but if it's not a mood issue, at least now for, you know, spiritually and for the movement, I really encourage us all to be, to, to be open-hearted um, ab about that. Um, the other thing that I have a little concern about is um, that I think the movement can be a little bit Eurocentric. And it's particularly, this, I see this play out particularly in terms of cuisine. And I've always wondered why, like if you go to any of the real local foods restaurants, like the, the stellar ones, Chez Panisse or whatever, you'll, you will of course find on the menu chocolate. You will of course find on the menu coffee. You will of course find in the food black pepper. You will of course find things made with white sugar white flour. All of these things are imported. None of them are grown locally. And yet you won't find coconut milk. You won't find curry. You won't find cumin. Um, you will find cinnamon, but you won't find curry. And there's, it, it comes down to something that's sort of um, an, an aesthetic kind of European grounding with food that's not really, that, that's, that's kind of reactive, that's not really about where our food comes from or the distance that it comes from. I kind of tend to go the other side. I mean, to me, uh, coffee is an addictive stimulant that is, um, you know, 
you know, challenging our immune systems. I mean, I am very uh, susceptible to coffee addiction. I'm kind of always going off or, off or on it. I can, I can smoke a cigarette and then not care the next day. I can drink a glass of wine and not care the next day, but coffee gets me hooked right away. Whereas coconut milk is one of our very few sources for lauric acid. It's now being used by people with HIV and, and, and immune system problems because it's such an amazing immune system builder. One of the best things to have if you're sick is some chicken broth with some coconut milk. It's very, very good for you. And yet our movement is, it's okay to have coffee, even though that grows only tropically, but it's not okay to have coconut milk. Sometimes there's that little sub, subtext in there. And I just kind of want to question that because I think it's very important. I love cooking the cuisines of the world. I do a lot of, you know, really simple sort of based on what's local, keep it, you know, keep it simple kind of pureed soups. But I love to make, you know, a Thai style curry using all locally grown organic vegetables. It completely enlivens my diet and it teaches me about a part of the world and another people. We also are a multicultural society, and it's important that this movement embrace people of, with all of their backgrounds and all of their culinary tastes. And I think that there's really a way to be balanced about what you can get locally and seasonally, get locally and seasonally. But I, I feel like there's, some, there's always going to be some foods, and there have traditionally in most cultures been some foods that are imported. And there's a difference between importing apples from New Zealand, when we can grow apples in Sebastopol, and importing curry powder. There's a difference. It's not the same thing. It doesn't make any sense to import apples from New Zealand. And it's very bad for our economics. But a little curry powder from India or uh, coconut milk from Thailand can make a great, you know, curried apple soup with coconut milk <laughs> using local, local apples. So. Um, I just want to kind of throw that out because I think that that's um, something for us to think about and also that we haven't really started thinking, you know, if really this petroleum thing is really as bad as it looks and, and the global warming and all of these problems, we really need to be thinking too about um, a little bit more in terms of like hemispheres. And there, I got an email about uh, a month ago from a new company that's just started in Mexico making coconut oil. And almost all of our coconut oil at this point is coming from Indonesia. And I'm a fan of coconut oil because it's so, it's so nourishing, it's so good for us. And it's a lovely thing to work with in the kitchen too. Um, but it's coming from very, very far away. Well, this company started in Mexico and they sent me this email trying to get me to get the word out about their coconut oil. And they say, you know, it's much more, it's coming from a much shorter distance than Indonesia. And so even things like coffee and chocolate, I mean, we have in, in Central America, we have um, tro a tropical climate that we could have a relationship with in terms of growing those foods that we might want that are tropical. And I think that's worth cultivating too. It's not just like, it's only local or it's coming from, you know, somewhere else. It's like, no, there's, I mean, even Star Route Farms, which is one of the, you know, sort of premier um, organic farms in Marin County, they've started a winter farm so that they can produce winter produce, and it's down in the Imperial Valley. It's like a, you know, 10 hour drive to get that produce. I mean, you're, you're almost to Mexico. <laughs> you're halfway to Mexico when you're down there. I don't even know what could it be grown in Baja, California. I have no idea, but I think we need to be thinking a little bit more in terms of, you know, there's, there's the 1,000 miles, there's the 10,000 miles, there's all these different you know, um, distances. And if petroleum is really precious, then we need to be thinking about those things too. I'm also interested in the, in the idea that there could be maybe sort of sister communities between North and South around, the, around food. So that you know, a community like Willits could partner with you know, a community in Chiapas. And, and actually form a relationship with that community and support the growing of things that we might want here, bananas, coffee, chocolate, coconut milk, whatever those things are. So there's some, maybe some different ways that we can think about this. And I think, I think we need to be sort of open-minded about that. Um, okay, now what time is it? Okay, this last thing, so the, um, the eat, so the eat low, and I'm also gonna pass around, so, this is kind of along those lines. I made um, a, uh, like a food, my own food pyramid. It goes the other direction. Um, because one, I've never understood why you'd want, the thing that you want people to eat the least of to put that on the top. 
That's a little counterintuitive. Like, you know, the thing that you want to eat the least of, it's like the dregs at the bottom of the pot, you know? Um, so, and, and also, I don't know if you guys read um, that book everybody read, uh, um, The Da Vinci Code. Um, <laughs> In the Da Vinci Code, there's this whole thing about the pyramid being a masculine symbol and the inverted pyramid being a feminine symbol. So I couldn't help but throw that in. So anyway, <laughs> it's my inverted pyramid. So, um, oh, so I'll pass this around. So the thing that we should be eating the most of at the top of the pyramid is fresh, locally grown produce bought directly from small ecological farms, meat, eggs, and dairy products bought directly from small-scale ranchers who practice humane animal husbandry, and anything you grow yourself, any of, all of which should be home cooked into delicious meals. So that's like, that's like the big chunk of our diet, right? And then um, under that, broken into two sections, I have in one section naturally leavened whole grain breads, farmstead cheeses, raw honeys, nut butters, jams, and olive oils from artisanal producers. You know, things that are being produced on a really small scale locally. Also, um, organic beans, legumes, grains, and other staples from natural food stores, co-ops, or mail order cooked into meals at home. So combining these things. We're using what we can get locally. I mean, they're growing wheat um, out there at, um, at Live Power. And so there are some options for grains that are local, but they're f they're, it's harder to find. Um, and then the next section is what I call imported but wonderful ingredients such as coconut milk, fish sauce, soy sauce, oils and spices cooked into meals that celebrate the cuisines of the world. This is, I have just a real passion for the cuisines of the world and I, th I think it's really important to honor that. And we have the opportunity to. And we go and eat those places anyway. You know, you go out for Thai food anyway. You might as well learn to cook it at home using live power broccoli. It's good. Um, and then meals from independent restaurants, cafes, or other local businesses, you know, the whole kind of local, you know, economic thing. Um, and then down here is packaged convenience foods from natural groceries. Probably you eat some of these anyway. You know, those, you just got to just have that little, you know, whatever packaged pot pie that you stick or whatever. Um, or even, you know, um, all of those packaged convenience foods. Potato chips, you know, you eat some of that stuff. It's okay. And then, um, and then down here at the... Almost next to the bottom is conventional brands, meals and snacks. You know, this is what you have to do when you're taking a plane and you have to eat at the little pizza place in the airport, you know. You hate it, but you're starving. You've got to do it, unless you really planned ahead. And then at the very bottom, the dregs is junk food. Because I have to admit that every once in a while I like a Reese's peanut butter cup. Okay, just every once in a while. So th this is sort of my vision for, let's just, you know, sort of relax and have a space for everything, but really em embrace the, the, the bulk of it being from places like Live Power. And then on the back, I've just put um, two lists that are in my book, that I've adapted from in my book. One is Be a Locavore, and it's a list of, I've, my book is arranged in 13 chapters because it's 13 moons that move through the year. And so all my lists are 13 in the book. So this is um, 13 plant foods that can be grown successfully anywhere in the continental United States and so can be eaten locally and in season without any need for importation. So it's a list of 13 foods that there's just no reason ever to import. And then a sec the second list is the list I call worth the trip, 13 foods that I use in my kitchen that are imported or shipped. So things that I feel like are worth, for me anyway, having in the kitchen, even though I can't get them that are locally grown. So I'll just pass these around. Yeah. yeah. Can you talk about your oh. oh, the full moon feasts. Yeah. So the um, the book is called Full Moon Feast, and it'll be out in March. Um, you can go to my website and find a link. And I actually do um, dinners, which I call Full Moon Feast. They're on the Saturday closest to the full moon in San Francisco at a church. And there's a link on my website where you can send me an email that you want to be invited to those. I send out an evite. Is how that works. And then I've got a new moon newsletter. I do everything by the moon. Um, a new moon newsletter, it comes out around the new moon. And I, as I said, this is also the structure for the book. I take an old moon name, either from Farmer's Almanac or an old indigenous moon name and that relates to food and I write about that thing. So for example, this weekend, the moon will be new. It'll be the start of the hunger moon. So somehow I write about hunger. The next moon, will be the sap moon. So I usually write about sweetness, sugar, sap, something like that. Then it's the egg moon, the milk moon, going through the year like that. Um, and that's also the structure of the book. So I've got a um, sign-up sheet here 
which I'll pass around. If you, if you want to get the New Moon newsletter, you can sign up here. And then I've also got a, a list that says, I have a question that says Bay Area, yes or no, and you can decide whether, um, which you want to pick, because I, I, I mean, you can decide because what that means is if you say yes, then I'll put you on my Bay Area list, which would let you know about classes um, or any events that I'm doing locally in the Bay, Bay Area. So you can just decide whether you might ever want to take that three hour trip to come to a cooking class or anything with me. And if not, just put no. So I'll pass that around. I don't share the list with anybody. It's, I'm very, and I don't send lots of garbage either. We have enough <coughs> garbage in our lives. Okay, so we're back to our soup now. Hopefully everything's soft. That's the goal. Yeah, could be softer. It's good I talked a little bit longer. It's pretty good. These carrots, I should have cut the carrots a little smaller. I think, I think we'll make it work. Um, okay, well, I just wanted to, re I want to read you guys one thing really quick. This is what I, I was going to read you from my, um, I was going to talk a little bit about milk and pasteurization, but um, before, we're going to use some of Gloria's milk here, and I just have to read this. This is, um, uh, a book by Maya Tiwari called Ayurveda, Life of Balance. And though I have some disagreements with her about certain things, she writes really beautifully about food and relationship. And um, I'm, I'm, I really grieve the loss of the milkman. You know, a hundred years ago, you had pasture-fed raw milk delivered to your house every morning. Now, who got rid of that? That was really bad. That was really bad, but so um, she writes about, uh, she's an Indian woman who grew up in Guyana, and she writes about um, uh, her, the milkman they had. Um, you know, she says, I grew up in an, in an idyllic village not far from the sea. In the still afternoons, women gathered on their kitchen verandas and sifted through grains and dolls. The lithe ebony milkman, whose feet were always in flight, would arrive before tea and fill the milk buckets that were waiting for him on the landing below. The milk was delivered, buff-colored and foaming, within the hour of the milking. It was never pre-boiled. Milk was a vital and living food for as long as the ancestry could remember. The cows were gentle and happy. They grazed in the green pastures of fertile and rich land. They roamed by instinct with their own rhythm. No one questioned why they should seek shelter from the blazing sun or why they sat and gazed with those stupendous lotus eyes. It was the norm to find them sleeping in the middle of the roads. Bicycles and other vehicles careened around them until they were covered with dust. No child felt threatened by the presence of the cows. They were part of the dynamism of our life. A field without grazing cows would have been inconceivable in those evanescent afternoons. So, I just love, love that, buff colored and foaming within the hour of the milking, which is how I feel about this, because I just want to show you, I don't know if you can see this beautiful color that this, that this milk has, you know, and, and even this is our great local organics, you know, Strauss milk, but, you know, see how white this is compared to this, this beautiful buff, I mean, it's a buff color, that's why I had to read that to you. Um, so we're just really, really lucky to get that, um, that nourishment, and that all has to do with, you know, the cows being out on pasture and uh, the beta carotenes that they're getting, which, you know, so few, uh, which our feedlot cows don't get. It's very, very nutritional as well as um, connecting. So um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn this off. I'm going to pull out the bouquet garni. Turn this off. And I don't think I put any salt or pepper in. I've brought some salt when I was eating locally for the month of August last year. I found a, a West Coast salt. It's called Sonoma sea salt. And it says that it is um, produced on the West Coast of the United States. It is solar <coughs> excuse me, evaporated from the clean waters of the Pacific Ocean. So I usually use Celtic sea salt, but so we'll put some salt in, put some pepper in. Hello. There's hardly any coming out of there. Is there a reason for putting it so in the end rather than the beginning? No. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, the, the reason, reason, I mean, of course, there's a reason for everything. But. <laughs> um, 
the reason is that I was, uh, you know, I was a vegetarian for so long and learned how to cook as a vegetarian. I was always making beans, and you, you have to salt beans at the end. And so it just became part of my thing to not salt till the end. But this you could have salted at the beginning. It would have been just as good, if not better. But you guys all know that beans will harden if you salt them before they're soft. You've got to wait till beans get soft before you salt them. Or add any acid. OK, so uh, immersion blender. Critical, critical tool. Um, this isn't actually the one I'd recommend. This is, this is a cheap one that somebody gave me. It's like a $15 one. Um, but I do think that it's better if you have the money to invest in one that's got a stainless steel top rather than plastic, because um, it's not great to be putting plastic in hot things over and over again. Um, and I just haven't. But there's, you know, this was like, I think, $15, and the stainless steel tips are like 100 So <clears throat> it's, it's a little bit more expensive. But if you want to make pureed soups, this is the tool to have. It's, it means you only have one pot rather than two pots and a blender and burned hands and splatters on your ceiling. So, huh? Oh, this is the one I use. Huh? Oh, what is it? Sorry, uh, I don't know. It's got to have a name. It says America. Everything has a brand name. I don't know what kind it is. Oh, um, anything with a stainless steel top. I did see there were some uh, with stainless steel tips um, that were running as low as $40. On the, you know, I don't think it really matters. I mean, there's... Um, there's a famous brand that I'm blanking on right now, but it's very expensive. I don't think it really matters. Excuse me, I'm, I'm just going to blend for a second. <laughs> and then we're going to put, put milk in. And see if we can not have a baby food texture. We'll see if we have a golden color or not. There was a while where we thought we might not be able to get carrots. So I said it'll just be silver vegetable bisque. That's fine. Usually it doesn't take this long to blend, but it's a big pot of soup. But usually it's like two minutes. Um, in terms of, I've given you a whole range of options on dairy on there, and that's because I use whatever, any one of those. It's either whatever I have, or I look at the, the thickness and the texture of the soup, and I decide which dairy product to use based on that. If the soup's too thin, I'll use something thick like creme fraiche. If the soup's too thick, I'll use milk, you know, to thin it out. So you can kind of just use your senses and see what's going on there. And this, I knew this was going to be really thick. It's got all those starchy vegetables in it and very little water. Okay, it's, it's not going to be, I wouldn't pass the test at school, but it's going to have little chunks in it and everything, but I'm just going to move on. I went to the Natural Gourmet Cookery School in New York, which at the time was the only chef's training program in the country that focused on food and health and the environment, though now there's, there's at least one other one. Um, but it was a vegan program, which you can tell I'm not anymore. Not at all vegan, so we're going to... Pour all that milk in. It's possible. It's, it's, it's kind of a goal with me when I'm using raw milk like this is to try to get it so that, you know, I'm not heating it over 115 degrees. That's the temperature at which enzymes die. Um, and you can tell when something's over 115 degrees by just putting your finger in it. And if you can't hold your finger there, it's too hot for the enzymes. If you can hold your finger there, then it's not. I was kind of hoping by pouring in the milk really fast that I would cool the soup down enough to... Um, and and I, don't think, I don't think all, even if you're killing enzymes, I don't think you kill them all. I think you're still, you, you still have some. But... Uh, yeah, yeah. Straight from the cow, buff colored and foaming. Um, or the goat, or the sheep, or the camel, or the horse. Or the yak. Okay, it's not, it's not quite golden, I hate to tell you guys. 
it's more buff colored. <laughs> we didn't put enough carrots in to get the golden color. You'll just have to. Okay, so I need. Um, can I have one of those spoons? Yeah, and if you guys can pass out the silverware. So, um, one, or the, the, the non silverware. Um, I will just tell you that we're using um, compostable spoons. So, um, we need to figure out a way to collect them. And then maybe somebody has a nice hot compost pile that they'd be willing to put them in. Um, and of course, recycled napkins that could also go into a compost pile. And paper cuts, cups, which I don't see why they can't go into a compost pile. So we might be able to divert all of this from the waste stream, which would be a lovely thing. Um, oops, what am I doing? So this is, this is a stage of soup making that people uh, neglect, which is to taste it. <laughs> it's very important. Oh, you could. I didn't think of that. But we've already wrapped the spoons. Well, now we have choice. Now you have choice. You can keep the spoons for the next time. Yeah, if you want to drink it. Needs more salt. Um, so when you're tasting, I actually taste for, um, for the four flavors. I taste for sweet, for salty, for spicy, and for sour. It's nice to have them all in there. The spicy comes from black pepper in this. In the European tradition, that's the, you know, one of the main sources. The salty comes from salt. Also, the savory flavor also comes from the celery a little bit. We've got buttloads of sweet in here. No lack of sweet. We've got parsnips. We've got rutabaga. We've got carrots. They're all very sweet. So I'm trying to balance the sweetness out a little bit. Mmm, getting better. And a little more salt. What's the the sour? Oh, the sour. Did I left that one off. Well, um, if it's too sweet, it's, it's often nice to put a little dollop of yogurt in it, either on top or to put some yogurt in and blend it in. Just to, just to add a little acidity. What about lemon? Well, that's not um, well, you run the risk if you put lemon in a soup that has milk in it of curdling it. So... You gotta be you gotta be careful with lemon and dairy or tomato and dairy. You gotta you gotta know what you're doing. Risky business. I'm just trying to get the texture a little bit more silky. It's a little bit not silky. We'll see. And maybe I will put. If the sweetness, if it's really too sweet, um, you know, parsnip soup is very nice paired with like a really sharp cheddar cheese, like a really nice aged cheddar cheese for a lot of depth. Because, and they've both got that kind of British. Mm, I think it's pretty good. I'm pretty happy. Um, we haven't used um, this cream yet. Yes, yes, yes. yes we want cream. Um, Cream, cream, because remember it's one of those logs, one of those big logs in the fire. Um, I'm just trying to figure out, you could drizzle the cream on top. I think the cream might, um, well, let's find out, see if the cream sinks. And if the cream sinks, then I'm just going to mix the cream in and then we'll put yogurt on top. So experimentation. You know, they say, whoop, yeah, you kind of get a little bit of a view there. You eat with your eyes first, right? So it has to look good. I'm lazy about a lot of things, but not how it looks. And then it needs a little, okay. And really, really it needs like some chives or some parsley or some scallions, but okay, we don't have any of those things. Okay, let me just try this. Mmm, oh, that cream is so good. Wow. Okay. Little shot. We're going to give you guys all little shot glasses. And the soup, the soup will hopefully arrive to you warm enough so that you're not frustrated by its lack of warmth, but um, not so hot that we're, you know, but cool enough that we've got our enzymes still 
still active. Um, okay, so we're gonna yeah we're gonna put a little cream on top. So I haven't put any acid in this, and I've but I've thought about it, and I've decided we don't need it. Um, so we're gonna do a little um, a little bit of soup in each one, a little bit of cream on top, and a little grind of pepper on top, and we're gonna pass them around. And while we're doing that, um, yeah, if people want to help, that's great. We could use yeah, and we could use a third person to grind pepper. Yeah, why don't you why don't you do soup? And Jason, yeah. Um, so, are there any other questions while we're, while I'm, I'm letting my wonderful assistants um, do this? Yeah. Wine has an Yeah. Um, I don't tend to. Okay. So, as you can see, the soup is very simple, um, because it. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I know that was some funny timing. Um, yeah, it's a kind of a lot of pressure. This isn't the soup sipping contest. This is, you know. This is the soup made in front of you guys, okay? So it's as good as it is, whatever it is. Um, when I do my pureed vegetable soups, I pretty much follow this formula, which is very, very simple. Just onions, maybe a, a light chicken broth or water, and then finish with a dairy product. And I don't tend, I, I, wine is a very aggressive flavor. It's a very distinct flavor. And I don't particularly, I don't, I don't, you know, the kind of out on a limb for me would be to put some cheddar cheese on top of this or something. I just like to kind of keep it simple. I really experience the vegetables more that way. Also, then I don't have to think, oh, it would be better if I had wine, and oh, it's too bad I don't have wine. You know, I don't have to get caught in that kind of that craving desire thing of something that's uh, completely unnecessary. But wine, I love to use um, to braise meats. You know, I mean, I'll braise them in water if. That's all I've got. But if I have some wine, even if it's turned a little acidic, then um, you know, then uh, you know, I'll, I'll sear a meat and then I'll braise it in that. I love that. Or I, I kind of require. I really want wine or something similar if I'm doing risotto. So I have things that I want wine for that really wear the wine. I mean, risotto is kind of a boring dish. It needs, need you know, it, the rice is kind of not quite enough on its own. It, it needs some help, so I really want there to be wine. I want there to be Parmesan cheese. I want there to be thyme and you know porcini mushrooms, preferably, and <laughs> stock. You know things like that. So, but in here, I this is pretty much how I make it. I just like to keep it simple. That's just me. But you could, you you know, you wouldn't put a red wine in. Obviously, you'd put a white wine. But go for it and just watch the acidity with the cream thing. You know, if the wine's if the wine's old and acidic. Uh, the cider. No, not the cider. The vinegar that you were talking about, is that apple cider vinegar? Or? Doesn't matter. Anything doesn't. except distilled white vinegar, which is not really okay. my problem. I really do think that there's, um, there's, there's good reason to be concerned about our so our, the minerals in our soil and the depletion of our soil. And it's one of those really sort of deep, difficult questions that we've sort of treated the soil like, um, like a mine, you know, and we've, we've extracted the nutrients from it. And um, this is something that's very worris worrisome to me in terms of, um, you know, just, just human health in terms of the sustainability of, of how many people the earth can support. And I really do think that we've got pretty bad mineral shortages in our, in our diets. So um, I just, I don't think leaving a little dirt on the bottom of the parsnip is going to do that. Um, is going gonna, is gonna to correct that. I mean, if people are going around and eating these, these soil meals, then maybe they're getting something better but you know there's other things that you can buy you can get um, there's something called concentrate which is a little um, just a trace mineral supplement that you can add to your water or to your cooking and that's probably worthwhile to do and things like I mean bones are really one of our best sources of minerals um, so you know making a making bone broth on a regular basis is um, is a really good source of minerals and of course biodynamically grown produce from farms where they're, where they're constantly replenishing, which is how it should be working. We should be, you know, taking out, putting back in, taking out, putting back in. The day that I was up at Life Power, what I, the, the way I spent the day was um, building the compost pile with layering manure and um, uh, straw. And um, also Stephen was sprinkling some kinds of mineral supplements or something in there as we were going through. I don't remember what it was, but... Um, you know, if you have, if you're a member of a farm like that, that's biodynamic, that's really looking at, you know, farming as a relationship with the, the earth, not just as a, um, you know, a bank account to take out of, uh, then that's a really great. What about eating 
Yeah, you, there, you know, there's, um, you've got to be careful about the brands, and there's some concern. I kind of, I stopped taking some of those things just because there was some concern about um, uh, toxic metal, trace toxic metal amounts, and I don't, oh, oh, the question was, what about azomite, which is, which is a, um, a, an organic uh, farming supplement that some people take internally because um, it's, it's really rich in a lot of minerals, but somebody that I know did some research on it, was concerned about, you know, toxic levels of certain things, and I just decided I was going to just not take it until I felt like that was, he's a little bit paranoid, so it was hard to know whether to trust him or not. But maybe, you know, he says I'm paranoid for a reason, so I don't know. Five minutes? Yeah. Um, I use it a little bit. Um, I think it's great. I use kombu in my beans. You know, I put a piece of kombu in my beans um, because it not only mineralizes, but it also helps uh, the digestion of the beans and so forth. Um, again, I feel like uh, seaweed is a, it's a concentrated sort of superfood, and so you do have to be a little bit careful and kind of know what you're doing with it. Um, so I think it's, it's, it's gr they're great foods, but I think you just need to be a little bit careful. Because um, they're definitely in the, in the vegan and health food and macrobiotic movement where people who ate too much seaweed. You can eat too much if it's, it's not, not balanced, balanced by other things. things. Yeah. yeah. I wanted to ask you about bay leaves. Um, the ones that grow around here, is that what people use for cooking? You can, you, you can use them. The, the classic ones are the Turkish or European uh, bay. But, um, you know, there's been, a, <coughs> excuse me, a little bit of debate about whether there's toxicity in these, in the local ones. I feel like that debate has kind of been resolved in the negative, that, that, that they're okay to eat, and I do, um, I do use them. It's really fun when you're camping, if you can find a bay tree, to find the really little baby ones. Ooh, they're so yummy. You can just, um, you know, pick them and sprinkle them on top because they're tender. You can just eat them, really little, tiny, really pale green ones. I don't think there is. It's just that that was a a rumor going around. When you pay enough, when you pay as much attention to food, you hear all kinds of things, and you just have to kind of wait and see where it falls. Um, no, I think they're totally fine to use, and you're using a very small quantity too. You're just, you know, you're flavoring something. And bay gives a great flavor. It's really sort of indispensable for European cooking. Yeah. Do you have any comments about soy? Um, <laughs> yes. yes. <laughs> um, I believe that uh, uh, so soy products, um, when they are long fermented in traditional forms, are um, a great condiment and supplement in the diet. I think that all of the um, non-traditional uh, soy products that are being promoted right now are extremely um, dangerous to the health, including soy milk and um, large quantities of tofu. I think tofu is fine in small quantities. Tofu was always eaten in, uh, in dashi, in a miso broth, and the dashi was made with um, you know, whole dried grated fish. So it's very mineral rich broth, and it was just eaten in small quantities as a, um, as a condiment. I think that's the appropriate use for tofu, and I really don't have any use for, for soy milk, soy cheeses, soy protein isolate I think is really, really dangerous. So I'm, but, but there's a space for soy if it's fermented. So, soy sauce, tempeh, miso. I do think that there's, there's a lot of layers with food and there's also the, the Ayurvedic layers and coconut, coconut products are very cooling and people who have um, you know, pitta disorders, elevated pitta, coconut is gonna be one of the best things to bring it down. So there's just all of these layers and I think really what it comes down to is trusting your body. When you taste something, how does it, how does it work? And if your body breaks out and breaks down, and there's a place for ancestral foods, but there's, um, but I think it's uh, dangerous to get too attached to that because, you know, different things grow in all different parts of the world, and people move around. We're incredibly mobile. I'm very concerned, for example, with um, vitamin D deficiency in African Americans who were brought here and are used to getting all the vitamin D that they need from the sun, where they, you know they evolved where they have enough sunlight all year round to synthesize the, the vitamin D that they need, and now they're living in Detroit, you know, or New York, or Boston, where they only have access to, you know, sunlight three months out of the year. 
and there's, you know, there's just rampant vitamin D deficiency. The only food-based sources for vitamin D are you know, oily fish, basically oily fish and livers and you know, cod liver oil. So there, there's so many, I mean, those people are completely displaced from their ancestral home and it, there's just lots and lots of layers. So I think, I think saying to, you know, to eat what your ancestors ate can be incredibly restorative and can have its place, but I think we shouldn't get attached to one thing more, you know, too much. I think it's just part of the picture. That would be my feeling. Okay, I'm done. Thank you all so much for having me. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>